All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Uh, we are exciting to kick off in a few minutes here. We will uh, just give folks a chance to join uh, before we kick off the webinar. Like we still got a few more folks joining in. There we go. Morning, Derek. Good morning. How you doing? Good. How are you guys? Good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All righty. Well, thanks for joining uh, the webinar today, everyone. We are looking forward uh, to giving you guys another great topic uh, by Justin and Derek. Um, before I kick it over to them, just want to go over a few things for our webinar. You will see the Q&A section here in the uh, bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Um, please feel free to drop any uh, questions throughout the presentation. We'll open it up for Q&A after the presentation. After the webinar, you'll also get a survey right after um, in your browser. Um, there, for all of our folks who are um, using this for one credit of CFPCE um, credit, you can go ahead and put in your ID, um, your information there, and then that way we can submit your information uh, to make sure you get credit um, for viewing the webinar. If you'd also, uh, for our newcomers, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Income Lab or have a few more questions, you can also indicate that in the comments section in the survey as well, and then our team is more than happy to reach out. Okay. All right, Justin, Derek, that's my spiel. I will uh, turn it over to you guys. Okay. Thanks, Mackley. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. So today's uh, topic is uh, using economic data in retirement income planning. And um, some of this came from, there's a, a, an article in, on kitsis.com that I did um, almost a year ago now. Um, so you may have you may have seen a little bit of this, but I've updated a lot of the data um, through uh, kind of the end of November, and I think it'll be kind of an interesting uh, interesting case study of how things change over over a year. I've also um, included a little bit more on kind of practically speaking how you can use economic data. Um, when doing retirement income planning, when communicating with clients. And I want to talk a little bit about how this actually plays out in practice in, um, in Income Lab at the end, because a lot of people uh, last time were kind of like, okay, this is really cool kind of, um, you know, academic stuff, but, but what does it really mean? So hopefully we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on that. Um, so I think when you, when you talk about economic context, um, you know, people people can often think about um, you know using economic context when they're making investment decisions, and I think we all know that that's like that's a very fraught thing to do, right? Uh, it's it would be very tempting to to think that we could find some economic indicator or some stock um, measure or something like that that would help us predict exactly you know what returns will be and so on. Um, but the great thing about retirement income planning is um, I've talked about this before. It's a series of relatively small spends, relatively small uh, liabilities that that we experience over a long period of time. So just think about it as, you know, putting gas in the car, buying groceries, you know, maybe paying your property tax bill. Some are bigger than others, but all are small compared to the overall uh, amount that you'll have to spend in retirement. Um, and because it plays out over such a long period of time, longer term um, you know, kind of economic measures of like, okay, well, you know, what's the world like right now? They actually have a fair amount of um, explanatory power when doing retirement income planning. They're not perfect. There is, there is no, uh, there's no measure I've seen, and I don't think there ever will be that will tell you, you know, this is what my client can spend. I'm positive of it. I'll never have to adjust it. That's not a thing. However, I don't think that there's evidence that ignoring these things entirely is helpful either. Um, 
So uh, what we'll do is go over three examples at the beginning here of, um, of kind of longer term measures that can help that provide some information um, both for retirement planning analytics, but also for just communicating with clients about what they might want to expect in retirement. Um, and then, as I said, we'll talk about um, that communication piece and the, you know, okay, what's this actually mean for tilting my income advice, um, you know, up or down over time. Okay, so let's dive into the examples. So the first is probably the most kind of well-known or, or most well-studied, uh, which is price to earnings ratios or longer term price earnings ratio, which I'll just call CAPE. Um, so that's cyclically adjusted PE. Um, and that was kind of made famous um, by Schiller, um, but there's been a lot of work. Uh, Michael Kitsis did some work on it. it this has appeared in you know, a few of the academic journals on kind of how this, um, this has an impact uh, on retirement income planning. So the first piece is kind of that shift from PE, kind of current PE, whether that's, a, you know, whether earnings are last quarter's earnings or projected this quarter's earnings. Um, but as we extend kind of the window size for the earnings piece here, um, the explanatory power gets better. So if I'm using, you know, just one quarter's, one quarter's earnings, my explanatory power measured by R squared here, but it's just the higher, the better, basically, um, is very, it's relatively low. It's actually a little uh, lower than that if I, if I go down uh, even further. But as I get up to 10 years, which is the classic CAPE, it's the one that you'll see um, in pieces on whether we can kind of predict stock returns over, over the, the kind of medium term. Um, you'll typically see a 10-year CAPE. But even as we extend it further to a 20-year CAPE, um, our explanatory power gets better. And what I'm comparing here is, okay, how much explanatory power does CAPE have um, for sustainable withdrawal rates? So I'm just using kind of a, a classic, um, simplistic uh, persona of a retiree who's trying to fund 30 years of retirement with a 60-40 portfolio. Uh, those of you who've heard um, uh, Derek and I talked before that, that is, you know, that's not typically how people actually behave, right? I mean, people have other income flows, they, they change their spending over time and so on. But this is a, it's a reasonable simplification to kind of, um, you know, study this kind of thing. So what this is showing us is, A, you actually, there is a fair amount of explanatory power um, for, for this uh, particular measure for retirement income planning that's based on systematic withdrawals from a portfolio. Um, and B, kind of the longer we term um, we use, the, the more power we have here. So, um, you know, this isn't about kind of quick decisions. Okay, something changed this month, so therefore everything has changed. It's really, okay, what's the, what's kind of the environment that we just lived through after the last, you know, decade or two? Um, that gives us information about um, what we might be living through um, in the future. So this has an uh, you know, inverse relationship. This is pretty well known. So the higher CAPE is, um, the lower my sustainable withdrawal rate. The lower CAPE is, the higher my sustainable withdrawal rate. The cool thing about that is, and, and we've talked about this before, other people have, um, what that actually tends to mean is that um, you know, in, in periods of high CAPE, people have actually pretty healthy uh, investment portfolio balances. And so, yeah, they can they can take a lower withdrawal rate historically, but it's off of a higher balance. And then vice versa, if CAPE is really low, that typically means people have experienced really bad returns recently. Um, and so their portfolios will have a lower portfolio balance than, than they might like. But historically, at least, they've actually been able to afford to take more as a percentage of that lower portfolio balance. So, which kind of you know, does some work to bring those those kind of outlier or edge cases, you know, closer to the middle. It doesn't make them equivalent, but it does kind of ease the burden a little bit um, for people who find themselves retiring in, you know, kind of the worst or best, um, you know, kind of the peak or the trough of a of a market. Um, so what I've done here is uh, I've I've put twenty year cape. Uh, in here and and um, you know typically again you you will see ten year cape used in in uh, 
in, in a lot of publications. But it's interesting what's happened just over the last year. So if we compare kind of the end of 2021 to the end of November, so almost end of 2022, 20 year CAPE has gone from, you know, almost its peak ever. Um, so this, the, the last peak was in, you know, just before the tech bubble, um, down to, you know, certainly not, uh, not average, um, but, but down significantly. There's another thing to keep in mind when you're looking at CAPE, um, which is that earnings number, that hasn't necessarily been measured the same over the last 150 years. So there are arguments that, yeah, okay, it looks like CAPE has been elevated since, you know, the 90s. Um, and it maybe it has been, but it's also possible that changes in how we measure earnings um, have affected this. So, so maybe this elevation is, is a little bit of a kind of an artifact. Um, so I, I think this is a reason that people are sometimes a little wary on, you know, allowing CAPE to totally drive your, your decisions in retirement income planning. I think that's, that's a, a, a fair warning. Um, but even so, I think we've, we've seen not, not surprisingly that over the last year, this CAPE number has, has come down, you know, quite a bit from that, from that peak that looked like a kind of a scary peak. Um, the thing about CAPE though, is it's really most useful for, um, retirement plans that are heavily dependent on stocks, right? I mean, it basically is a stock indicator. It's a, it's a, uh, an indicator of, of stock valuations. Are, are stocks expensive or are they cheap? Um, and again, not, not every retirement plan relies heavily on stocks. Uh, people may often, you know, have more balanced portfolios or even a bond heavy portfolio. They, they may have, um, you know, mixes of income that don't even include portfolios. Um, so there's another measure that, um, that I, I introduced in that Kitsis article, and I think is really useful. I call it the nest egg. So, and really what this is doing is it's measuring the sequence of returns that we've just lived through. But I think rather than kind of focusing on it as a mathematical concept, I like to think of it more as a story. So if I had saved systematically um, over the over my um, you know working years, and again, we could look at different different numbers of working years, kind of like with Cape, we 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 said, well, you know, how how long of a window do we look at here? Well, if we look at uh, you know, how long my savings period could have been, I can go, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20. Well, it looks like if I look at kind of 30, 35 years of savings, which actually for a lot of people matches their savings period. And I did, you know, systematic investing adjusted for inflation, right? Exactly the opposite of systematic uh, withdrawals. Uh, during that period, um, I can measure how much uh, my nest egg would have been worth um, had I just completed, let's say, 35 years of, of savings. Um, and if I do that, I get the blue line here, which when I compare it to the red line, which is sustainable withdrawal. So this is in the past. So I know what somebody could have afforded to withdraw in terms, withdraw in terms of a, a withdrawal rate. I get this really nice kind of butterfly pattern, right? So that's, an, again, an inverse relationship. Uh, you don't have to focus on the exact values here. Just focus on the fact that they're a mirror image of each other, essentially. So this has a, a, a correlation, if I recall, of um, a, a, around negative negative eight, negative point eight, or I think between negative point eight and point nine. Um, so a, a really strong correlation between these things, which is really just saying, hey, if you've lived through a sequence of returns um, that was really strong you're more likely to have a sequence of returns that's really weak. Or if you've just lived through a sequence of returns that was really weak, you're more likely to live through a sequence of returns that, that's really strong. And actually in the middle, it's the same, right? If you live through kind of a, a medium-ish sequence of returns, you're likely to continue that, uh, which is why kind of in the middle, we, we get them uh, very close to each other. Um, so the nice thing about this measure is uh, you can use it to, to measure kind of any portfolio. It could be a bond portfolio, a stock portfolio, a, a blended portfolio, and so on. Um, and again, I mentioned that the, the power of the nest egg uh, measure gets a lot stronger as we go toward longer periods. So again, we're above kind of 30 years or really even above 20 years. You're looking at strong um, explanatory power. And again, uh, there's really been quite a change in um, 
in the nest egg measure since the end of last year. And it was interesting kind of on that point of, okay, is CAPE maybe not the best measurement because of changes in accounting rules and how, you know, earnings are measured. Um, even at the end of 2021, um, this measure, nest egg, was, it was elevated compared to historical averages, but but not as much as CAPE, um, not nearly as much. So, so I think that adds a little bit of a um, some cred credence to this idea that maybe maybe CAPE is artificially elevated. But even you know compared to the end of 2021, we've come down a lot um, to 2020 end of 2022. Right again, not surprising given the the 2022 that we've had. So um, we were um, you know above the historical mean at the end of 2021. We've not quite one standard deviation above. Uh, so, you know, 0.73 above. Um, so certainly above, you know, even, you know, pretty, pretty high above, but you can see nothing compared to what we were in kind of the, the tech bubble times of the, of 2000. Um, now we're actually below the historical mean. Um, this, this measure is below the historical mean. So I think what that potentially does is gives us a little bit of hope. Um, certainly, does, it's it's never calling you know sort of the bottom of a market or anything like that. But um, but what we do see, if we think that there's kind of reversion to the mean and these experiences people could have, um, it, it's saying okay, well we've 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 definitely absorbed, you know, we've gotten rid of a lot of our above average. And now we're actually slightly below the historical mean in this in this measure. Um, and all of these numbers are just sixty forty portfolios. So you know, depending on the portfolio, things would be uh, potentially a little, little bit different. Okay, and the last uh, measure is inflation. So, I, you know, this is obviously a big topic um, right now, and uh, and this is one where what we find again is that short-term inflation. So, if I just looked at you know the the, the rate of inflation since last year uh, is almost useless in um, in helping us, you know, kind of explain or or um, you know, tilt our income advice. Um, so kind of like with stock returns, you know, um, current PE is not all that helpful. Current inflation isn't either. And the main reason for that is we've had periods historically of, of high inflation that have only lasted a year or maybe two years. Um, in fact, in the post-war period, I think it was uh, 47 and 51, there were spikes of inflation up to 20% that quickly went down. Um, now, there have been others that have lasted a long time, like in the 70s and early 80s, right? And so because of that, kind of that short-term inflation is not all that helpful. However, longer-term inflation does have reasonable explanatory power. You can see here as that window of kind of, okay, what's the average inflation that I've been living through over the last 10, 20 years? Again, you see this starts to, this starts to have something to say for us. Um, unlike CAPE, so stock valuations or nest egg, which is measuring, you know, my my recent market experience, those are inverse relationships. So higher nest egg, lower withdrawals, higher cape, lower withdrawals, low nest egg, high withdrawals, low cape, high withdrawals. Here we have a, a, a direct correlation. So if you've been living through a period of low inflation, um, that tends to mean um, lower withdrawals will be possible. If you've been living through a period of high inflation, that tends to mean higher withdrawals are possible. And the reason for that, that can be a little counterintuitive, right? Um, the reason for that is if you've had a really long period of high inflation, there is kind of a reversion to the mean effect in inflation. And so it's sort of saying, well, look, this can only last so much longer. Maybe we'll have in interest rates coming down, inflation coming down. And so that will support a higher um, withdrawal rate. And historically, that that has been true. So here we see, for example, you know, the post-war period, we had uh, these, you're never going to see one of these at, you know, 20 or something because it's a, it's a long period of, um, of averaging. But in the post-war period, we had higher withdrawals and higher inflation. In the early 80s, we had higher withdrawals and higher inflation. We know in retrospect, right at the time, uh, that would have uh, it would have felt pretty bad. And in the in the mid 60s, we had low inflation and low withdrawals. Uh, that's actually the you know the period that gave us the the four percent rule. So uh, again, this is kind of a um, if we have sort of a longer view, right, and we're not sort of looking at the last last month's CPI print every every time um, there is actually something to be said here about retirement income planning. 
Um, and since probably a lot of uh, us are curious, this kind of longer term inflation average is still really low um, currently um, because we just, you know, we, we had such low inflation between the financial crisis. And now it's certainly been high over the last year plus, but that hasn't been enough to drive that that average um, uh, up yet. Okay. All right. So takeaways from this are um, longer visions and versions of economic measures tend to have more explanatory power. They, they can help us more in retirement income planning. And this is, I think it's just, it's part of this great thing about retirement income planning, which is things unfold slowly. And that what that does is actually gives advisors the ability to deliver a lot of value because they're really, your advice on adjustments um, really is, re is really valuable. And you kind of have time to, to do the analysis. Obviously income lab software is, is meant to help you do that, but um, this isn't about kind of really short term adjustments or, or, or making quick calls. Um, the other takeaway here, I think, is that these indicators have have really changed since the end of 2021. So um, they've gone from, you know, on the Cape and nest egg side being really elevated to being, you know, closer to kind of average um, or maybe even below average in the case of in the case of nest egg. So maybe a little uh, glimmer of hope there for uh, for retirees who are depending on uh, portfolio withdrawals. OK. So how can we actually use this economic context to, to talk with clients? Um, I think the the first here is probably the, the most important, um, which is just enriching client communication, helping clients understand that, you know, different, different economic environments tend to offer different kinds of retirement experiences. And first, just just showing them that, that that is the case, which is probably intuitive to them, and then saying, "Hey, we don't, we of course cannot know exactly what you're about to live through, but you know, given what we do know, this this looks more likely than you know something else." Um, the second thing you can do is actually use economic and context to tilt your advice up or down, depending on whether income risk is estimated to be high or low. And so we'll talk about both of these now. Um, so let's imagine, for example, you have a client who is really dependent on portfolio withdrawals. Um, you can use uh, a, a chart, which is kind of a historical context chart that says, hey, this is we, we given all the history that we know, we can actually measure how much someone could have spent from their portfolio um, if they had begun their retirement or been, you know, in your exact position uh, at that time. So this is a chart that um, it's available on Income Lab as well um, that, that shows exactly that, right? So if you were invested in a particular way and then you were about to live through a sequence of returns, you know, let's say starting in the mid 60s, right? Kind of this classic 4% period or starting in the earlier mid 80s, which was a incredibly high uh, withdrawal period. This is what we know you could have spent and still hit your, you know, your legacy goals or your specific spending goals and, and, and so on. Um, however, you can see there's there's quite a range, right? You have periods uh, kind of, um, you know, in the in the 60s and 70s that were quite depressed. You had periods in the 50s and 80s and 20s that were really high. So, you know, where where do you land, right? Uh, it, so, we can show here, you know, the green line is is proposed income. Um, this is annual uh, in Income Lab. Everything is is it's usually monthly, but um, okay. So let's say you know these folks are spending the the plan calls for forty five thousand um, dollars in withdrawals every year. You can you can say, well, look, um, historically there's been a, a real range in how much uh, an investment portfolio could support in withdrawals. But if we kind of filter out the blue stuff, right, which were times that just weren't as much like today, right, in economic terms, maybe. Maybe Cape was really low, right? Maybe nest egg was really low. Maybe inflation was was uh, long term. Inflation was really high. Then we we find ourselves with the red periods. And as you can see, this is why you know we're we're proposing forty five thousand dollars in annual withdrawals and not you know eighty thousand or something, right? Or even sixty, right? Now there have been a few times 
in the past where we would have had to make some some downward adjustments over time to keep you on track. But you can see this forty five thousand dollars level. It was sustainable in 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 almost every historical period. And in the periods where it wasn't, it, it was only slightly above. So we think this is kind of a prudent place for you to start. We'll be on the lookout for um, the need for downward adjustments, but also we'll be on the lookout for upward adjustments. Because as you can see, uh, you know, there were periods where actually a, a higher income level was sustainable. So we'll want to let you know if there's good news as well. Um, the the great thing about economic context and about these these kind of historical context graphs is uh, you can produce different ones depending on the client situation. So what we just saw was was just portfolio withdrawals, but again, that's not usually what makes up a, a person's whole retirement picture. So what I'm showing here is actually uh, someone who is only depending on a sixty thousand dollar year pension, so no no investments. Um, but this pension is not adjusted for inflation. So you're probably not going to recommend that they spend $60,000 a year because they won't be able to keep up with, with inflation. Um, and so the question is really, all right, how much of that 60000 should I start out spending and how much should I start out saving, right? Maybe I'm saving 15000 a year in the first year. And then as inflation goes up, I'll save a little less, a little less, a little less. I'm saving that into a, an investment portfolio. At some point, I'll start spending 60000 and then I'll actually start tapping that investment portfolio as well. Totally different decision, it feels like, right, um, compared to the how much should I withdraw from my portfolio. But actually, um, it's, it's, very, it's a very similar process. So um, we can look at history and say, all right, in times when inflation looked like it looks today, how much could someone have spent from this $60,000 a year nominal cash flow and how much would they have had to save? And so let's say you are proposing $35,000 in real spending from this. That's probably going to feel crazy to someone. Hey, you know, I'm getting 60,000. How could I, why do I have to save so much? Um, well, this gives you a feel for, hey, look, um, this is a level that we, we know was sustainable in in periods that were like today, um, except for in the in the sixties and early seventies. So you know we could go lower and and cover ourselves for you know nineteen seventies level stagflation, right? But what we're proposing here is something that we think um, you know it may require some downward adjustments, but it's it's sort of a, a prudent level at least compared to history. So um, another way to use these kind of historical context graphs is to is to dive into actual events, right? So maybe somebody's interested in you know the Great Depression or the the crash of of 1929, and you can say, well, look, this is we know exactly what the experience was since that point. Take, take the crash of 29, and we know what someone could have spent if they were about to experience the sequence of returns and sequence of inflation that that happened after that. And you know, here's your proposed income level. Let's compare it, right? So in this case, um, the proposed income level, a little under fifteen thousand a, a month, in this case, is below what someone we know could have could have spent in 1929. Could the future be different than this? Could it be worse than the past? Of course, of course. Um, but what we're doing is kind of connecting the income proposal to um, you know something that we know happened and something that's a, a, a sort of memorable. Um, for clients, which I think connecting things more to a to a story, to to a real event for, for some clients um, can be more understandable than kind of just statistics, um, you know, like a probability of success or even an income lab, a, you know, above plan, below plan kind of number. Okay, so let's uh, shift finally here to um, tilting retirement income advice. So we just talked kind of about how to talk with clients using historical context and economic context. But, um, you know, is there a way to actually um, allow this to have an influence on the advice um, that we're giving people? So uh, there, there definitely is. And I think that the one way to visualize this is just to think about the, the risk return trade-off in retirement planning. So instead of kind of you know, returns versus standard deviation or something like that. If you're used to thinking about, you know, um, the efficient frontier in, in portfolio construction, if we think about retirement income planning, um, it's always possible to have higher income in retirement, 
right? Higher spending. You just have to accept higher risk, right? Which is the risk you'll have to reduce uh, spending at some point in the future. It's always possible to have lower risk. Uh, you just have to lower spending, right? Lower income. And so this is just a this is just a trade-off. And different people will find themselves more comfortable on different parts of the of this curve of this this um, this range of possibilities. Um, and in fact, uh, in Income Lab. The income setting slider is exactly this. So if you if you move it left toward the conservative side, you're just you're moving down on the risk, down on the spending. If you move up on the income, uh, you're you're moving to higher risk and higher spending, and then you're able to explore um, what that uh, what that looks like. So, um, you know, we sometimes talk about like you know if a client if you ask a client, well, you know, how much do you want in retirement? It's not uncommon for people to say, well, well, how much can I have? Um, and so this is kind of answering that question for you. Um, how much can you have? Well, it depends on the, your, your sort of risk tolerance. Once I, once I uh, peg down your risk tolerance, I can tell you how much you can have. And we could look at this in a, in a curve. Um, so for example, um, in this case, you know, if, if I said I'm, I'm comfortable with a, with a risk level of 20, which is equivalent to uh, a uh, probability of success of 80, right? So it's a probability of failure of 20 or a probability of adjust of downward adjustment of 20. Um, okay, these folks can spend about $52,000 a year. Maybe we want to be more conservative, go down to a 10. Okay, they can spend 45, six. Uh, maybe we want to go down even further to five, right? Okay, they can spend uh, $40,900, right? So um, this is sort of, imagine you were sort of guessing and checking in, in, a, in a static, uh, planning platform, these would be the numbers that you'd get out. So this is what this curve looks like. I can always go to higher income, but I'm, I'm going to have to uh, accept higher risk. Okay. So uh, one way you can allow economic context to influence um, spending advice is by um, using historical data to, to build you know, these, these risk curves. Or another way to think about it is use historical data as your model of the world, right? It's the thing that you're using to measure risk, uh, to measure sequence of returns, right? And so on. And there are some, a lot of advantages to this, including that, that when you do that, you kind of get for free the fact that, you know, correlations between asset classes change over time. Um, uh, you know, average return, standard deviations change over time. That's not something you can capture in kind of a standard Monte Carlo. Um, so if we do this, we, what we can do is kind of say, all right, let's filter out those periods that are not like today, right? It's just like the, the chart we just saw um, where I'm going to filter out, you know, 1924, right? The roaring 20s when stocks were just going up every day. Uh, I'm going to filter out, you know, the, the mid 80s where things were, were going to go great. Um, and just look at period, let's say, let's focus on CAPE. Let's let's get rid of all the low cape periods, right? Because I I don't know if you know cape has hit a bottom, um, but I know it's um, it, it's not a super low cape period historically, right? So let's just filter those out. And for for 2022, you know this is what we would get the the blue line, which is all of history. Everything goes down when I do that, right? Which means that all right, spending less. Of my portfolio at this period is could be prudent if I think that CAPE has something to tell me. Let's look at what it would have looked like in 1982, though, when CAPE was really low. At that period, you would have been filtering out high CAPE periods, right? Historically. So it, both of these examples, I'm only using the history that was available at that point. So in 1982, I'm only looking backward. I'm not looking forward. Okay. And that's in that case, um, the blue line is all of history. But if I filter out high CAPE periods, my everything goes up, meaning uh, this, what I can spend was was higher um, if I took CAPE into account, right? At every risk level, right? So um, you're saying, well, look, maybe maybe you do want a, a 80% probability of success or 20% risk, as we call it. Um, that's fine, but you're actually going to be able to spend more. That's what uh, uh, you're you're seeing here. And in Income Lab, this is if you're using economic context with a historical analysis type, this is exactly what's happening, right? So you will see the uh, the amount of income somebody can have changing. Um, I think I want to dwell on this just for a second. Um, so sometimes when, you know, people come to Income Lab and 
and we talk about historic or economic context, um, which we, we actually don't talk about all that much uh, because you don't even have to use it. But it, sometimes I think maybe there's sort of a, um, you know, something built into the software that says explicitly, hey, if CAPE is 40, then spend this. If CAPE is six, then spend this. There's not. There, there is, there's no explicit kind of, you know, formula somewhere that says, you know, let's let's derive your proposed income from economic, you know, indicators like a like a regression uh, or something. Um, the reason we don't do that is as soon as you write down that formula, you're wrong. Uh, it, it, there's just uh, there, there's no way you're going to be correct doing something like that. The other problem with it is is it doesn't um, acknowledge that actually there's a curve that you can spend more. You just have to accept more risk. So. We don't want a formula that spits out exactly what you you can spend. Um, we want something that always gives you options, a, a range of options, right? That moving that income setting slider um, always gives you those options. Um, in fact, I, I want to, as we're talking about that, I'm just going to shift to to show you what that looks like. So, you know, for example, you know, here's a plan. Um, where uh, where our income setting slider is 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 at the middle. You know, let's say for these folks, that's more than enough um, for them to spend, right? If they have desired a monthly income of twelve thousand, um, well, I can just get more conservative. So pull the income setting slider over. Keeping all the, the goals the same, so same legacy goal. I believe this plan has some some special spending goals as well. Okay, so I knocked up a couple thousand dollars in in income. I'm still way above our goal, so there's other tweaks I I probably would do in a plan like this. But the key is that you're you're really just moving down that curve, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, if I maybe it's somebody who just really feels they want to live now and they're happy to pull back to a a more moderate um, place in the future, I can go all the way to the aggressive side. Right, so now I'm back up to up to that uh, 20 range. Um, if you're curious about where on that kind of risk uh, scale you are, um, let's see here. You can see it in the in the power planning tab. So right now I'm at an estimated 40% risk, right? So a risk of 40. So it's kind of equivalent to a 60% probability of success. Go down here, now I'm at 20. So these are just five, five point moves, right? Now I'm at an estimated zero risk. Always estimated, right? Because uh, we know the, the future will probably surprise us, but... Okay, let me go back to. There's one other place that um, that historical context, economic context can can really help, um, and that's in developing capital market assumptions. So I'm just going to close with this. Um, I think Derek and I will probably do a, a, a full presentation on it at some point. Um, but we've talked about this before um, that you know most software uses kind of a traditional Monte Carlo analysis, which just uh, has one set of capital market assumptions for the entire plan, whether that plan is 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 10 years, it's the same capital market assumptions. The assumption is always that every year um, has the same expected return, and then there's a variation around that return. Um, that has a, a, a lot, that assumption has a lot of problems with it, right? Not not the least of which is if you if you believe there's reason to assume you know lower returns over the near term you are also assuming lower returns over the long term in that situation or vice versa maybe you think that there's reason to assume higher returns in the near term well then you're going to assume them for the whole plan so that's why there's been a, a kind of a renewed interest recently um i've seen others talk about it as well uh, in kind of a regime based uh monte carlo meaning you can have some assumptions about what you think the near term could be like um, maybe higher inflation, maybe lower re real returns, things like that. And then you also can have longer term assumptions, right? Maybe those are, that's reversion to the mean, or you're just using his, you know pure historical averages for that period. Um, and doing this 
um, really allows you to have economic context um, play a role. Uh, and there's there's good evidence that that doing this gives you better kind of results in retirement income planning. Um, so when we produce our, our default capital market assumptions for regime based, um, you're more than welcome to to state your own. But if you're using our defaults, it's all purely formulaic. So there's no kind of what's my opinion, uh, what's the opinion of income lab built into this. We use historical averages, but the difference is for for our defaults for for traditional Monte Carlo, we use just you know historical averages. We use fifty year averages. Um, but for regime based, we look at we take all of history and then we remove periods that were least like today. So the blue stuff here. And then we use, we say, okay, the first 10 years from the red periods we'll use for our near term, the, the subsequent 20 years we'll, we'll use for long term. So now you can see you're getting kind of sequence of return, sequence of inflation assumptions that kind of better match periods that were more like today. Were those periods exactly like today? No, of course not. They just, we're just ignoring the periods that we, that are, that are least like today. And when we do that, um, and, and actually run a study that says, well, what if someone, you know, used that process to create their capital market assumptions um, through all of history? We can actually test whether the those the 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 model of the world you get the the risk measures, the probability of success measures, um, were good or not. So think of this as equivalent to um, somebody, uh, you know, predicting rain, right? A meteorologist predicting rain. Well, it's it's not all that common that they say there's a hundred percent chance of rain. It just certainly happens. Right. Um, but you know, if they're predicting 10% chance of rain, uh, and it rains a lot, whenever they do that, that's not a good prediction. Right. Uh, whereas if they predicted 90% and it rained a lot, that is a really good prediction. Vice versa. If they're predicting 90% chance of rain and it doesn't rain most of those times, that's not a good prediction. Right. Uh, it, they should have gone with the 10, for example. So that's, that's very similar to what we're doing when, when you're using a Monte Carlo, for example. And so Derek and I have been doing some work on this. This is kind of preliminary and we'll be getting a lot more out on that. But what we do see is um, that by including that kind of economic context, regime-based Monte Carlo, um, you get a much stronger uh, model of the world. So you get better results closer to reality using regime-based Monte Carlo and actually using historical as well. Not, not quite as good, but very similar compared to um, traditional Monte Carlo. So what, what you're seeing here is something called a Breyer score. The only thing to understand is lower is better. So zero would be no error. You're, you're either predicting 100% or zero and you're always right. Um, so um, with probabilistic stuff like measure, like predicting the weather, you're never gonna have a zero. Um, Prior score, um, but low is low is good, and you can see we get essentially, you know, twenty to thirty percent less error by using historical and regime based Monte Carlo. Um, and one reason for that is it's it's acknowledging um, economic context. So, like I said, this is this is sort of like a teaser. Uh, we'll be talking a lot more about this uh, in the future. But um, one thing we really see here is um, if you're just using traditional Monte Carlo, you're really kind of using a machine to to predict or to to make um, plans that is not the not the best machine available um, out there, not the best uh, you know weather predictor. So uh, with that, I know uh, Derek is on here, and uh, maybe we can get some thoughts on kind of talking with clients about um, about historical context and economic context. Yeah, and I think for me, you know, a lot of what we've talked about here today and the behind the scenes, the the numbers, the math, that all really lies in the realm more of if we we're physicians, kind of the the doctor understanding EKG and what goes behind it and how to use it, how to take numbers out of it. Um, so I think it's very important for planners to understand, you know, all these implications of economic context and how do we how does that influence how much we can recommend that clients should spend and how do we use tools to get that best recommendation for our clients. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of how I'm actually using economic context and talking to clients tends to be much, much simpler, right? I'm not getting into the weeds of how the guardrails are adjusted or anything like that. Uh, more than maybe using, I really like that historical visual uh, to show, you know, here are the periods that are more or less 
like today and talking about, um, in particular, for many of my clients and the plans that I run, oftentimes I get that, uh, you know, the the target spending level is even below the recommended spending level. Uh, so I also like to talk in terms of here's how conservative you know, we're being with the spending level here. So here's, you know, different amounts you could have spent across history. Here's what you know, is recommended. Here's how much you could spend. Here's what you told me your target was. It's often even lower than that. Now that could vary based on the clients you tend to work with, but for my clients, it's often lower than that. So I do like to make that point of just, you know, this is pretty conservative by historical, um, by historical measures. And I think many people will look at that chart in particular and think, oh yeah, actually, wait a minute. There's, there's some bad times in here. There's the, you know, the great depression, there's the world wars, there's all these things that um, you know might make today's crisis of the day, you know, not seem like it's uh, as big of a deal. So, I do think that does help. Um, this visual in particular is one I like to go to and to point out the areas of here are the times that were more like today, and here's why. You know, yes, you could have spent much more in some of these periods, but they didn't really uh, match today's circumstances very closely. Yeah, I think this is sort of, in my mind, the closest, you know, if you showed somebody, a, hey, you have a 75% probability of success, it, that puts their mind in a particular place of like, hey, can I get to 100, right? It feels like you're incentivizing them something. This is more of a like, like, like paint a picture. It's probably doesn't work for every, every client, right? I mean, some people like graphs, some people don't, but you can at least say, well, look, um, like you said, the history does contain some pretty dark periods economically and you know, not historically. Um, and it, like you said, if if you happen to be proposing a plan where um, you know the proposed income is maybe at or below the worst of these periods, you're not saying, well, therefore, you know, there's no chance we'll ever we'll ever have to reduce our income. But but you are saying, well, we're planning. It gives you a sense of how conservative the plan is that is not just, well, can I get this number to 100, right, which is not always the right answer for people. Uh, but it is saying, well, look, we've planned for stagflation in the 70s, in a sense, right, because, hey, your proposed income would have would have handled that, right? You would have survived 1970s stagflation. Or we're planning for a Great Depression level, you know, global economic slowdown. Um, because this this spending level would have survived that. Again, does that mean the future will be exactly this? Of course not. And 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 you know, I think most clients understand that. But you're giving a like a really clear like uh, example of why this plan is you know where it is and um, you know is set up to withstand certain shocks or or, or problems, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's really something to kind of making this less of a you know because you could report similar statistics, you know, that are just numbers on a chart. Um, but here, when you actually look through history and you see the world wars, you see the different historical events that are on there, you can toggle on or off the recessions, the different things that you can do, um, to me, just makes it a much more tangible and, frankly, interesting piece of um, information on the client's plan for them to directly deal with. So I do really like um, this chart in particular for talking about economic context and just how I personally use the tools. Once we get into guardrails, once we get into other stuff, I'm not talking much about it. It's kind of when I'm showing this and initially setting the stage that I will touch touch on it a little bit more. Yeah, and I wanted to share just uh, what Derek was talking about there. So, um, you know, this is just a, a, a fake client, right? So maybe, maybe this, so the green line is there, um, you know, their, their kind of proposed budget, um, may or may not be accurate. A lot of people probably are under underestimating how much they might spend so that, you know, maybe this number could be a little higher, but you can see, okay, the green is way below kind of the worst periods in history. Um, if you want to, you can show, you know, recessions, there are lots of them. Um, you can zoom in, right. So you could sort of say, you know, okay, well, there's a lot of talk right now about kind of 1960s, 1970s level, um, stagflation, um, okay, we can see uh what one interesting thing about recessions is there there's really like almost no correlation to to how much you can spend. There, just, there have been so many recessions, they tend to be relatively short. Um, so I think uh recessions tend to be a little bit of a red herring in um in talking about retirement income, but you can you know share that with clients. 
Um, and you can see this is actually exactly this situation where the, the black line, which is the proposed income, actually survived 1970s level stagflation, um, you know, just fine. There were certainly, a, you know, a couple spots, right? This is kind of where the 4% rule came from, these periods in the mid to late 60s. Um, but, but you can dive in and really focus on, on those areas uh, if you want. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. Um, I, we, we do have a few questions already in the Q&A, but for our attendees, please, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A and we'll uh, spend the last uh, 10 minutes here or so um, walking through some of those answers. Um, first two questions, more kind of feedback um, in the initial part of the uh, uh, webinar, Justin, when you were talking about CAPE, um, just a thought on, uh, you know, can we include CAPE in the income lab reports? Um, and then we had another uh, question on, is there a way to add the historical context chart to the printable reports in income lab? Yeah. Um, so as for the first one, we have some uh, pretty exciting features coming uh, next year, first quarter. Um, uh, you'll probably see them in beta, um, maybe even in January, but but I would think almost certainly in February, uh, where you'll see some of some more um, kind of understandable, you know, digestible types of approaches to these kind of economic context uh, issues. So yeah, stay tuned for those. Um, and as for the report, um, uh, yes, definitely we will we will be adding that back. I know there were some issues with just getting the dis disclosures and disclaimers right on it, but we'll be putting that back. Perfect. Um, so next question here is, um, you know, what do you say to clients who cite the 4% rule, guidance 5%, or even the most recent Morningstar article that says, you know, below 4% rates, um, and then Income Lab, you know, says it's higher? I'd be happy to at least share yeah. Yeah. my opinions <laughs> on, on that. The way I like to approach that is often to go to, um, and maybe, uh, Justin, you could even show the chart where you can see the actual cash flows for a given client's plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I like to do that, we've talked about before that whole, often for many retirees, the retirement distribution hatchet, which you're kind of seeing a version of here. It's not quite hatchet-like, but you can see it's clearly not just a consistent portfolio you know, withdrawal uh, all the way across retirement, right? This, this is real numbers. So it would just be a flat line if we were talking about the 4% or Guyton Clinger guardrails or other types of strategies. So to me, we can take a look at a chart like this and see it just actually doesn't, um, that's not what we see oftentimes in a client's plan. And particularly for somebody who's uh, deferring social security, maybe that you know retiree, somebody's approaching retirement, you might see much more of that blade of the hatchet than we even see in this scenario where the distribution rate might fall from 9% in early years down to 1% and beyond going on. And then to, for me, um, you know, the, it just is much, what you're getting with Income Lab is a number that actually is realistic to the planned spending of the client, whereas something like a 4% rule or the get, getting cleaner guardrails isn't accounting all the for all that client-specific uh, spending, the client-specific uh, longevity assumptions you're missing out on all of that. So to me, it's to go, I like to use a visual like this particular one to just show here's why your situation doesn't actually fit the 4% rule. Yeah, I think, uh, was it Einstein or somebody said like, uh, you should you should make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? So if you're just focusing on portfolio withdrawals, that's actually too simple for most people, right? You're, you've oversimplified. Um, so for these folks, you know, all I have here is two social securities and often there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, and then I think these folks probably have some special spending. Yeah. So they're doing some funding of grandkids college and they're paying off a mortgage. Right. So that's why you see, as, as Derek said, I probably wouldn't buy this hatchet. It looks a little, little, uh, you know, funky, uh, but you know, I, I'm, you're developing a plan where the portfolio withdrawals are meant to, to fit um, their exact situation and a flat, you know, it, withdraw exactly this amount from your portfolio forever would, would not, wouldn't match their goals here. I guess I, I will add to that too. I mean, there is the scenario where somebody's 
out past age 70. So there's no uh, social security or other types of deferral. There's no special circumstances in terms of goals for spending. Um, and so that would be a situation where it might match up closer to 4% rule. But in that scenario, we're often already farther into somebody's lifetime than, than they normally would have been looking at the 4% rule. Um, and we're also in a scenario where income lab might recommend that you could take more because we're planning for adjustment and something like the 4% rule assumes you're not going to adjust. You're going to spend blindly going forward. So that's another, it's a more, it's a more fair comparison when you have that set of circumstances, but I still think there's reasons why that number would be higher than 4% for somebody who's in their seventies um, and spending. Yeah, so often, and, and the, the um, retirement smile might come into play there as well. So that's kind of shifting some of your spending to younger years where you're more active. So there's a lot of reasons that you're, you're, you might not be have a 4% withdrawal rate. Awesome. And uh, just a reminder for our attendees, um, you'll have a survey at the end of the webinar where you can put in your CFP ID um, as well. So we'll, we'll track it all, all there um, for you all. Um, next question here is, have you done any similar economic context research in relation to other bond or equity markets? Um, curious if the U.S. markets include a bit of uh, survivorship bias. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't, we, we have not. I, I don't know if there's, I wouldn't be surprised if there's at least sort of CAPE type research out there for other markets. I know Wade Fow did some research on, on systematic withdrawal rates, looking at um, other countries. Um, I don't know, Derek, have you seen any? Yeah, I was going to mention uh, FAO's research on international. And obviously, I think it is a fair point that obviously the U.S., we've seen higher um, safe withdrawal rates than you might have seen in other countries. And I believe in his research, some of that was even 2% or lower in some other nations. So, I mean, I think it's it's something you know, being worth being mindful of. Um, at the same time, some of those smaller, I mean, it's just, uh, anytime you're talking about economic history, right? I mean, there's all sorts of factors that go into why some of those were much lower, much uh, possibly higher. U.S. kind of going through that historical period, rising to a global kind of superpower in that, that time. I mean, that's, that is something to be mindful of that, yes, maybe the, maybe that doesn't translate perfectly into the, the future. Um, but at the same time, I'm also not as far on the pessimistic side when you look at what what drove down some of the withdrawal rates in some of those countries. I don't know if that's something you also would want to plan for in terms of looking at the future, but uh, certainly an area where people could disagree. And that if you did feel like you didn't want to use the historical numbers, using something like Monte Carlo, adjusting the capital market assumptions, regime-based Monte Carlo to better reflect your views might be a way that you'd want to use that tool instead of relying so much on the historical. Awesome. And then uh, last question I see here is a um, two-part question. I'll answer the first part, but uh, does the software utilize assumptions with fixed index annuities included? Um, and then how do we contact for more information? As far as getting in touch with us um, for more information, at the uh, survey as well, at the end of the webinar, you can note um, you'd like to schedule a demo or have a team member reach out, and then uh, we'll get someone in touch with you after the demo. Um, but as far as the first question, Justin, Derek, does the software utilize assumptions with fixed index annuities included? So there's no kind of explicit fixed index annuity um, section in the software. I do. We have had more and more um, requests for annuity modeling. So I think that's probably something that, that you'll see next year. Um, I, that being said, I know there are people who, who do model fixed index annuities in, in the software. So if you get in touch with our um, onboarding crew or our, um, you know, support team, they, they can show you how to put those in. That's right. Okay. Well, coming up on our time again, Justin, Derek, thank you both so much for your time here. Um, for our viewers, thanks for joining. Um, again, please fill out the survey at the end, uh, as soon as we close this webinar and our team will be in touch as well as, uh, we'll grab your CFP ID and get that submitted for you as well. Um, and then for everyone here, happy holidays. And we'll look forward to seeing you all on the next one in the new year. Thanks, everybody. Take Thanks care, everyone. everyone.